Today we're going to be talking about stakeholder theory, which as I interpret it, is really just utilitarianism applied to organizations. And we're also going to talk about various issues that arise when we really try to apply utilitarian and other consequentialist modes of thinking. Um, it turns out there are philosophical difficulties. There are also real psychological difficulties. It is hard to do a consequentialist, consequentialist analysis correctly. There are various psychological factors that operate against us. So let's start by talking about stakeholder theory and what it is. It's something that has gotten a lot of attention in business ethics, but it really goes beyond businesses to any kind of organization. And the concept of stakeholder theory is not actually very difficult. A stakeholder is simply somebody affected by an action. So the very first thing we have to do, in a sense, when we're doing utilitarian analysis is to identify the options we have available to us and to identify who's affected by the choice among those options, right? We have to think through the decision. What is this decision between, and then who does it affect? This matters to whom, what I do. And a lot of decisions really affect no one but you. It's nice. You wear a certain pair of socks for the day, and your pants are long, and nobody sees what your socks are. It affects really only you, right? Nobody else sees them. Now, of course, if you cross your legs and all of a sudden your socks are visible, maybe it does. I had a friend in high school who wore purple socks all the time. It was very strange. <laughs> and it would have affected just him if his pants had been long enough. But since they weren't quite, the rest of us saw he was wearing purple socks and were either amused or appalled. Um, but there are certain people affected by actions. Those are called the stakeholders. Now, what are the principles of stakeholder theory? Well, the first one is just to consider the effects of your actions on all stakeholders, on all those affected. And that's why I say this is really a version of consequentialism. It is saying exactly what Bentham and Miller are saying. We think about the consequences of our actions, but the consequences for everybody, right? Not just for you or for me. Now, with respect to organizations, this is going to mean we can't just think about the people in the organization. We can't just think about the shareholders of our company. We can't just think about the people who work here or the people who own the company. Or if it's a nonprofit organization, we can't just talk about the people inside the organization. We've got to talk about everybody affected by it. Now, sometimes it's a pretty small set. Suppose you have a chess club. Who's affected by what goes on in the chess club? Everybody in the chess club, right? So it looks like they're the, the sort of shareholders, the members of the club, and the stakeholders are pretty much the same. Is there anybody else who's affected by what goes on at chess club? Maybe the parents of the people in the chess club. Okay, maybe the parents are affected, right? If, they, if it's kids, the parents have to actually bring the kids. Um, chess okay, chess bookies. Maybe if people are betting on these chess games. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Well, good. It's going to meet somewhere, and so the people who are possible competition for that space might be affected. Or maybe they're, I don't know, is it a loud chess club? Maybe it's a really loud chess club and they affect other people. Maybe they meet in the park and uh, other people are either intrigued or annoyed by the fact that they take over all these tables in the park. Um, other people who might be affected. Yeah. OK, yeah, people who run other clubs who were like, wait, we were going to meet in that room. Um, at a university like this, it can be actually surprisingly difficult to find rooms for certain activities. Um, sometimes it's easy. It all depends on when you want one. Late Friday afternoon, you're probably pretty good. <laughs> but there are lots of times where it's actually hard to find an empty room. Yeah. The store that sells chessboards. Good, the store that sells the chessboards and chess pieces. It may be that if this becomes really popular, they have lots of sales and so on. Or if these people are really obnoxious and make everybody else hate chess. Uh, you know, and that kind of thing can happen, by the way. Porsche did a survey years ago of people. And they, they identified possible Porsche owners 
but then tried to figure out, well, if you'd like Porsches, why don't you own one? And they found that the main reason was because other people hate Porsche drivers. And so they <laughs> started surveying people who are not really potential Porsche people, and they found out, they basically said, okay, you know, and they showed them images. Here's somebody driving a VW. Here's somebody driving a Dodge. Just describe the person, given that it's, and it's the same photograph of a person, right, just in different cars. And so they go, you know, people describe the stere their stereotype of people who drive a certain car. Guess the most popular adjective applied to the Porsche driver. Yes, <laughs> okay, it was the obscene version of arrogant. Uh, and they realized, okay, that's why people who actually like Porsches and would like to own one and can afford one and so on aren't buying them. They think other people are gonna think that of them if they, ha they have one. And so they started a marketing campaign, not actually designed to sell you a Porsche, but to make you think better of Porsche drivers. <laughs> And, and I think to some extent it worked. I think that image has now shifted to BMW. <laughs> but anyway, whatever. Uh, the idea there was to think, okay, who's affected by this? And it turns out lots more people than you might initially think of might be affected, even by a small group. Now, if you're thinking about a corporation, especially a large corporation, you know, there might be a huge number of people affected, including those who don't buy your product. What about a nonprofit group? Let's say you start a volunteer organization that works with people in, I don't know, the poorer sections of town, uh, trying to get food and clothing to those who need it. Who is affected by your action? Oh, yeah. Government, tax write-offs. Ah, okay, good. The government may be affected. There are laws governing what you do. There are tax write-offs you may be able to get from con for contributing to this organization. The people in the organization, obviously, and the people helped are affected. Yeah. I'm really going to say the same thing. The people receiving your unused clothes. Good. The people receiving all of this, um, maybe the people donating it, um, they're helped. They, they've been watching Marie Kondo. I saw a little news item this week from the uh, Wall Street Journal that said, so many people are watching this Marie Kondo tidying thing and getting into this craze that now people are being overwhelmed with junk. Essentially, all these places you can donate things to suddenly have all this stuff. And it's like, nobody wants this stuff. <laughs> well, it depends. I mean, sometimes it's really nice stuff. Sometimes it's awful stuff. But anyway, um, that's something that, you know, you have to think through. Gosh, OK, there are all these effects. Yeah. Also, when you donate something to someone, then that means they don't have to spend that money buying that in the first place. So local businesses that would be receiving their money and whatnot. Ooh, that's a good point. So you donate these things, and then someone gets something there for a pre or for a reduced price, and then they don't buy it elsewhere. I got to admit, I, I tend to wear, well, old, but nice clothes. How can I afford some of this on a philosophy professor's salary? I shop at Goodwill, okay, in Northwest Austin. It's got actually a lot of terrible stuff, but some really nice stuff. <laughs> And here's the theory. I mean, there are a lot of fat cats who live in Northwest Austin. What do fat cats do? They get fat, and they donate their old clothes to, <laughs> to Goodwill. And I go and get, you know, shirts from Nordstrom's for seven bucks and stuff. It's outstanding. Anyway, so as we're thinking through what we do, and we'll say, you know, what are the steps to a consequentialist analysis of any kind? Well, the first one is to identify options. And the second one is going to be to identify the stakeholders. And it's harder than you think. That's the point. It's, there are lots of secondary effects. So it's off, often very easy to say, oh, the people who run the company or the people who work for the nonprofit, the people they help, they're the customers of the company, et cetera. But when you go one step beyond that, you realize there are lots of these other secondary effects. Yeah. Yes, externalities. Very, very good. So yeah, when we start thinking through the problems here, and I mentioned psychological factors. Actually, we might as well talk about all of this at once. 
um, there are these effects on people who are not aware they're even being affected tend to be called externalities. And some of them are positive, right? There can be good effects on other people, but there can also be negative effects. So yes, these effects on stakeholders are often termed in that economics literature externalities. And they can be good and bad. So think about our setting up this nonprofit um, to help people with food and clothing that we give away. Um, there are positive effects, many of them intended, right, for these people we're trying to help. There are probably positive effects on other people. So what are some additional positive externalities that you might not think of initially? We set up this place where people who are poor can come and get food and clothing, okay? So we're benefiting them, at least we hope we're benefiting them, right, if we're doing it right. Um, but who else are we benefiting that we don't even initially think about? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it may be that this helps that entire community, right? Maybe some of these people otherwise would be begging. Maybe some of them would actually steal. Um, maybe it just helps improve the, the mood in the community, right? People there are happier, and it has all sorts of secondary effects. If I'm hungry and grumpy, um, you know, I'm going to be mean to people around me. If I'm not hungry, I'm not grumpy, and so, hey, uh, the whole community might be improved by this in all sorts of ways. Yeah, Rigel. Um, I'm thinking the employee positive, you have a job to do at the nonprofit. Good. People have um, uh, jobs at this nonprofit, right? And so let's say some of them are volunteers. They're getting valuable experience. Some of them actually work there. They're getting a paycheck as well as experience. So all of those people are benefited. We didn't set it up for the benefit of the people working there, but it turns out that's a significant positive externality. Um, some of them may be in a part of town where they're constantly interacting with people who speak a different language, in which case one externality is all these people who are, are picking up Spanish, let's say, that they didn't have before and so on. And conversely, people in that community are sort of learning to interact with outsiders and so forth. So there may be lots of those kinds of benefits. Yeah? The, uh, the manager of the whole operation could be the successful thing. I mean, they did a good job. Okay, good. The person running this, they do a good job. And that not only gives them a sense of accomplishment, but maybe that enables them to then go on and do something else that also, with that experience and that benefit, they're going to be able to benefit even more people. Yeah. Uh, the taxpayer who doesn't have to spend for programs that are already taken care of in the nonprofit. Good, exactly. You might say government now doesn't have to worry about some of these problems because they're being handled by a private charity. And so the government says, yeah, good. Here are some people who don't actually need these benefits or these programs. Um, that can be especially important if it's the kind of thing that government uh, either isn't now handling or does, you know, can't handle very well. I know a dentist who donates some of his time to just sometimes in this community and sometimes overseas go and do dental work for free for people who can't afford it. And so that kind of thing can be a significant uh, benefit to the taxpayer who doesn't have to sort of worry about solving some of those problems. Other positive effects on others, yeah. Ah, okay, good. So there are those kind of secondary economic effects. Um, we actually, let's say, receive some clothing here and receive some food. We would have otherwise had to pay for that. And so we can now spend our money on something else. And so that means someone else is gaining economic activity out of that. That might be one of the ways in which this benefits that community. Um, people have more money then to spend on shops and other goods within that community. Yeah. Ah, good. So somebody's keeping accounts for the nonprofits. Somebody is keeping accounts for the people who are um, doing this, and so those people may benefit. So that's another sort of secondary benefit. Yeah. Uh, this kind of needs an explanation. Like uh, in poor communities, they don't feel like they're ready. I mean, I, I come from, so uh, they don't feel like they're ready to do interviews because of the lack of clothing they have. So depending on what kind of clothes being given, it's actually giving the employers for these future people. Ah. All right, good, good, good. Yeah, um, 
let's say people you know, have a job interview but don't have anything very appropriate to wear, going in and having the appropriate clothing, maybe something that gets them that job, that benefits the, whoever gets benefited by the work they do there, it benefits them, it benefits the employer, the, you know, the, the people who are interact with that person and so on. So exactly, um, there can be all this. Now, these can of course be negative. So what are some potential negative externalities of what we're doing? Yeah. Ah, okay, yes, so we might think, wait a minute. Um, we, <laughs> what is our role in the community for this nonprofit? You might think, are we doing anything to hurt anyone? Well, you might worry that really we aren't, mm, yeah, I like the way you put it, that we're not really integrating into the community in a way that helps people continually. We might help people over this, and maybe that's fine, right? Who's harmed if we just do that? But you might think, actually, it, we could so easily do this in the wrong way that would set up something negative for the community. And so that's why, actually, a lot of organizations like this will also have training programs and other things to stay involved in people's lives. Like, ah, you got that job, so you no longer really need the food and the clothing. But we'll have English as a second language classes, or we'll have other kinds of training classes here to keep, keep involved and to keep there being, from being any stigma, let's say, attached to coming here and getting this A or any other kind of negative thing. Yeah? I feel like this is kind of a neutral thing, but like on, on the one hand, the government isn't spending the money to fund that program, but because the people that donate to that deduct it from their taxes or else they're not getting money that they could allocate elsewhere. Okay, good. Um, it, you might say, wait, all these donations are lowering tax receipts. That increases the burden on tax, other taxpayers. Or you might say, gosh, what about these people getting the food and clothing for free? Now they aren't going to merchants in that community and buying food and clothing. That sometimes happens, especially with foreign aid. You send massive food aid to a country, and all of a sudden the farmers in that country find they can't sell their produce anymore because people can get it for free. <laughs> and so you can actually make the country more dependent on foreign aid than it was before because you're helping to undercut the agriculture in the country. And a small version of that could happen in this community. So much stuff, free stuff comes in that the people who are actually trying to make a living selling this have trouble. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, you could say, you know, this could increase tensions, right, if you do it wrong. You help this com community A, but community B right next door says, well, why, do you, you know, gosh, Catholic charities love them, they hate us, or something. <laughs> and so things could get weird, right, if you do this in the wrong way. It might be that you set up tensions. And so, um, so yeah, there's a danger there. Also, I mean, this could happen even less formally if you get the sense that the people in this organization play favorites. If, the, if people there get the sense that, oh, well, yeah, they say they'll help anybody, but really, you know, you can tell, and then substitute the bias that, that those people have for whatever it happens to be. Um, and so uh, it would be easy to have things set up that would lead people, and maybe not even the fault of the people in the organization, right? Say their donations all tend toward one kind of thing. It's like, oh, you want interview clothes? Well, you can't go there. You know, the, most of the people there have manual construction jobs, so you're good. if you need jeans, et cetera, sweatshirts, that's great, but if you need a suit, you know. So they're really only trying to serve a certain kind of person. It would be easy to set up that sort of dynamic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess that's corruption, too, but also corruption in that, like, a lot of governments, like, these countries donate to, like, they actually appropriate money Oh, okay, good. Um, as I'm envisioning this, this is small and it's highly transparent and so on, but you're absolutely right that even nonprofits that have good intentions can actually evolve in ways that are pernicious, can become corrupt. Um, you look at the amount of money that various nonprofit organizations spend on the actual problem as opposed to overhead 
the executive salaries, marketing, et cetera. And you find that it varies incredibly. I mean, some things spend as little as 3% on what their actual mission is, and 97% goes to the people in the organization. And even if the people who started it had good intentions, you know, by now it's become a scam. And they might actually start with bad intentions, as you point out. It might be corrupt from the start. So you might say, oh, donate this stuff. And then all the nice stuff. We actually set up our own little shop and sell. And we just give the junk in the, and have the sort of tax shelter for that. That would be sort of a small scale corruption. But a large scale corruption is, you're right, a lot of foreign aid ends up getting swallowed up by governments that end up corruptly using it, not to help their people, but to enrich themselves. Um, so uh, yeah, it's very easy for this to become corrupt in that way. It can be corrupt in another way, too. Um, it might be that you start realizing, wait, our organization grows to the extent that people perceive there to be a problem. So we have to make sure people perceive there to be a problem. And you know when that's easiest? When there's a real problem. So instead of actually helping to solve the problem, they go in and their incentive becomes to make it worse. And uh, that's been one of the main critiques of certain kinds of government programs. The people in the bureaucracies initially are the idealists who say, we want to do this. And then after a generation or two, it becomes careerists who say, I want a bigger budget and a bigger salary. And how do I get that? I actually make this problem worse. <laughs> so there is that kind of danger that the thing gradually evolves in a direction where it's taken over by more and more people who don't really believe in the in initial mission. Yeah? Um, you could have incompetent people accidentally that just botched up. Like PETA some time ago, they uh, kidnapped someone's dog and put it down or something like that. So oh, <laughs> OK. Yes, you can have organizations where, and, and again, as it grows, this gets tougher, right? When you're a small group and you've got four or five people working there, you, can, you, you know what people are doing. You can kind of manage that. But suppose your organization grows and you've got four or 5,000 people working for you. Do you know right now what's happening in the South Bend, Indiana you know, <laughs> chapter of your nonprofit organization? They may have all sorts of weird ideas. And they may do something like that as a stunt or try some marketing campaign. And you think, wait, no, what are you doing? So it can be very difficult to keep this large organization focused on its mission. And indeed, when we move on from the basic idea here to then how we set up an organization so that it continues to do this, part of stakeholder theory is that there are three levels of doing this. And it's very hard to keep track of all those three levels at once. Now, this is not just, it's not just an organizational problem, though it is a problem that becomes most obvious at the organizational level. It's a problem for people, too. But let's get to that, because it's very important to, I think, think about this. Notice that if we're going to do good for people and produce positive externalities instead of negative ones, we want to actually understand the effects of what we're doing. We have to not only identify the options and identify the stakeholders, but then we have to identify the risks, the potential costs, and also identify the potential benefits. And all of those things, we've been talking about some of the difficulties of doing that because they're very indirect. But now, as we go through this, it means, look, we really have to understand <laughs> a lot of stuff. We have to understand what the effects of our actions are going to be. And the secondary effects, as well as the initial effects, that means we have to understand what people are actually going to do. So you have to think, ah, oh, we set up this organization. But now, once it gets big, once it's not the people who believed in the mission who set it up at first, but it's actually the people they hired who then hired these people, who then hired these people, who then hired these, <laughs> right? Um, do we know what they're going to do and how they're going to understand all of this? Uh, Friedrich Hayek, in his book, The Road to Serfdom, writes a chapter called, Why the Worst Rise to the Top. <laughs> and his point is that over time, he's thinking of government bureaucracies, but actually, I think it tr it's true of almost all organizations. Over time, they tend to develop in ways that more and more serve the people in the organization and fulfill less and less the mission. And it happens in schools, where initially it's, let's teach those kids. 
And after a while, it's let's protect those teachers. It can happen in a university where it starts out being, yes, we're doing this for the students and the people of Texas. And then it becomes, well, we're really doing this for the faculty. And then it becomes, well, actually, we're doing it for the administrators. Um, and it's very easy for things to evolve in that way. So we have to understand the behavior, the values, and the context of the people we're going to be dealing with. We have to understand how they're going to react. Now, the third step, then, is the point about the levels. There are different levels of thinking about this. And Freeman, in setting up this theory, gives them different names. He calls them the rational, the process, and the transactional. Um, and maybe it's worth pointing those titles out, though I think they're kind of misleading in that all of them involve rationality, all of them involve transactions, uh, and so on. But really, the way I see it is this. One level <clears throat> is the overall mission. Now, as people, individual people, you know, if I say, what's your mission? Most of us don't really, I mean, it's not like I have one mission. Maybe you do. Maybe you say, to maximize happiness. <laughs> Maybe you say, to follow the categorical imperative, to seek the good without qualification. Maybe you say, virtue. Maybe you say, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Maybe you say, gosh, I don't know, to grab all the gusto I can, <laughs> to quote a beer commercial from my youth. Uh, whatever it is, OK, some people have a mission. You know, It's all about one thing, as the cowboy says in <clears throat> City Slickers. Um, but for most of us, it's not really about one thing. There are a bunch of things we want, a bunch of things we're trying to do. And so uh, organizations, however, are supposed to have a mission. If you say, well, you're setting up this club, so what's this club about? Say, well, lots of things, you know. Uh, that's weird. There's, there's a chess club, there's a debate club, and all this kind of thing, but do you have just a, hey, let's do cool stuff club? Um, I don't know. Actually, <laughs> maybe a fraternity is like that, yeah, yeah. OK, maybe there are some organizations that are like that. Um, Actually, I've known of some organizations who seem to have as their only mission becoming a bigger organization. <laughs> and I don't know. It's like, I don't get it. What are you trying to do? We're trying to get more members. So, well, <laughs> why? So they can get even more members. Uh, so there was a guy, I think, who started a Facebook page like this. I want to have more people following my page than anybody. But it's like, what? But like, for what purpose? What's this about? For like getting more followers. Uh, it's kind of like, I want to lead people. Lead them where? I don't know. Who cares? <laughs> lead them to get more people to follow me. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, you're supposed to, as an organization, have a mission. There's something you're trying to do. And so that's the overall goal. If you don't have that, then you're really not going to be able to think about strategy at all. And that's what level three, this is really about. These are levels of strategy. So he calls them enterprise strategy. So, but there are three levels of it. First of all, you've got to have that mission. Secondly, there's the question of process or procedures. You actually have to have rules you're going to follow, methods in general for trying to actually implement your mission. So first question is, what on earth are you trying to do? The second question is, well, how in general do you go about doing it? I have had all sorts of leaders in organizations who have some sort of specific mission. That is to say, they'll say, OK, here's our general mission, of course. But now, here's, what, here's the goal I want to reach. But then you say, well, uh, how, how are we going to do that? And they just have nothing to say. <laughs> OK. Um, it might be, gosh, it might be a nonprofit person who says, we are going to eliminate poverty in Austin. Well, that's a noble goal. So you say, how are you going to do it? I don't know. We're going to appoint a committee to study waste. <laughs> right? You might think, well, that's a disappointment. You know? I mean, we, we all would like to do that, but I don't see how you're going to do that. Or maybe it's a politician running on a platform that says, we will eliminate job insecurity. I think, cool, but like, how are you going to do that? Right? Nobody's ever going to get fired. Isn't that going to be kind of a problem? <laughs> um, and. <laughs> That's, 
that's true. So, okay, yeah, yeah, God, you'd be, you'd be France, man. I mean, nobody would work, but there'd be a lot of good cheese and wine. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, you might think, you need, this is sort of the how. How, in general, are you going to do this? What is the strategy for actually implementing your vision? And so it's one thing to have a goal. Um, I, I knew a guy whose goal as a student was to become the biggest philosopher in the world. <laughs> and, did, did he do it? Physically, yeah. His, his dream was to go, I mean, you've got to understand, this was before Arnold Schwarzenegger became governor of California and so on. His goal was to go to California and work out with Arnold and talk philosophy with him in the gym as they pumped out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and he was well on his way. I mean, he was a big guy. He was very, very strong. Um, he woke up at 4 in the morning, every morning, ate a pound of spaghetti. <laughs> Topped with an entire can of tuna for protein. This is the most interesting It was disgusting. Uh, was he a good philosopher? He was a really smart student, yeah. I think in the end he became an accountant. Uh, <laughs> so now maybe he's the biggest accountant in the world. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, he would do that. Then he would go to Gold's Gym and work out for about two hours. Um, and then he would come to campus. Uh, in one of our seminar rooms here, there's a very large table. And when we came in for the first class of the semester, it was not in the right, right position. It was like shoved up against one of the walls. And so uh, t another professor and I were team teaching this class. We thought, oh, this is a big, heavy table. How are we going to move this over? You know, maybe we can get a bunch of people. And he said, oh, no worries. I'll do it. Just picks up this wooden table that really would have been most of the length of this room. Just picks it up and moves over here. And the rest of us like, but so his dream of working out with Arnold was not crazy. I mean, he was huge um, and very, very strong. Uh, I was doing some landscape work in my backyard. And he said, oh, come over and help. Well, I and another guy were struggling to pick up these railroad ties to create these flower beds. He just, oh, come to, uh, come to Papa. Pick up a railroad tie and just carry it. Boom. No problem. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Was this a sound, <laughs> sound mind and a sound body type thing? I don't know. He wanted a, he wanted a very powerful mind and a very powerful body. Uh, well, anyway, yes, we have to have general methods, anyway, for achieving our mission. But then, of course, there's the day-to-day -day stuff. So maybe here's the general process. But then you have to think, how are people actually going to deal with this day-to-day, -day, right? The actual actions of actual people under that policy. And that's a different thing. So he calls this transactional. How does this actually get implemented day to day? Now, focusing on that kind of question is often boring. People love to talk about the big goals, the big missions. And people often don't mind dealing with these policy questions, the process. But when it comes down to the actual effects on people day to day and how it gets implemented, it sounds kind of boring. I did take a job one time where they said, all right, you know, right at the beginning, this was supposedly the inspirational speech. Our code word for this year is implementation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that's the dullest. <laughs> but I mean, this pe gets people excited. This, well, people see, OK, that's important. It's hard to get people to focus on this. It doesn't sound exciting. It doesn't sound interesting. But often, this is what really matters. And so part of his stress here is to say, when you're thinking about these effects on stakeholders and then what to do, it's not enough to think about your general goal and how, in general, you're going to try to approach it. Think about the, what that means day to day. What are you going to be doing? And often, people have this idea without thinking it through at this level. And it means they end up with something that's unworkable or that produces all sorts of weird incentives for the people in. We have to think about a variety of things involving the structure of our organization. We have to think about um, the general policies where it's going to, to, to set up. Um, we, we have to think about the functions. So again, at an individual level, we don't structure ourselves, but we do structure our time. If there are certain things that matter to you, you think, well, how am I going to structure my time so that I have time for all that? How am I going to build in hanging out with my friends and accomplishing my work 
and maybe earning a little money in that job on the side, and blah, 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 blah. You have to figure out how you're going to fit those things into your life. Or let's say your goal is to lose weight. It's one thing to say, yeah, I want to be thin. Or think about exercise. Yeah, I want to be very strong like Arnold. But then say, oh, well, how am I going to do it? Yeah, I'm going to lift weights. But then you think day to day, how are you going to actually make that happen? Right? I know all sorts of people who say, yeah, I'm going to do this. And then I know how to do it. They, they read many books on weightlifting, let's say. And then it's like, but do you ever go to the gym? Well, no, but I think about it. <laughs> right? I, well, I, I get that. But I mean, especially I know a lot of adults who are like, well, yeah, I really care about that. Oh, so like, that, when's the last time you lifted? Oh, um, I don't know, six months ago. I've been really busy. You know. It's like, well, yeah, you know. So that matters. You have to structure your whole organization and your time and so on so that you can actually do what you are setting out to do. OK. And all of this is hard. And we've been talking about some of the difficulties. But now let's identify more of those psychological factors. Identifying the options. First of, the first thing we have to do is say, what are our choices here? Right? It's a choice between what and what. Now, sometimes it's well-defined and it's given to us. You think, oh, I have to have a major. Well, you look through the course catalog and the course uh, schedule and so on. You see, ah, here are the possible majors. So yes, the university defines those choices for you. But in other cases, it's not so well-defined by something external to you. Hey, you got the, ex the next hour free. What are you going to do? It's not like the university says, ah, a free hour. Here are your choices for the following hour. <laughs> right? You've got to think about that. What kinds of mistakes do people make in identifying options? Oh, well, OK, good. Yeah, you can waste time identifying the options. Actually, in my family, we do a lot of that. So what would you like to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. We could play this game. We could play that game. We could watch TV. We could do that. Yeah. All right, well, wasting time is a big way, but what else? There are other pitfalls here. Yeah? Good, often you're not creative enough, right? And so you miss certain options. And that means you miss those opportunities. Actually, a lot of students coming to university have an idea of what they're going to major in, and it's shaped by things they were exposed to in high school. And that means they really have a much too restricted set of what the options are. They've never studied philosophy or anthropology or um, astronomy or whatever it is. And so they don't even think about that as in the realm of possibilities. Um, that's one way in which you can do this. Of course, you could also think certain things are options when they're not. You can think, well, if I get into trouble with money here, I'll just ask my uncle. And he'll bail me out. And <laughs> Turns out, unknown to you, your uncle hates you. <laughs> uh, so you could also be re unrealistic in the other direction. But more commonly, people just don't think of certain options. If I was good in my administrative tasks in any way, I think the main thing was thinking up options other people didn't think of and finding ways around rules. <laughs> Not by breaking rules exactly, but by saying, well, what if we did this instead? And people, oh, I never thought of that. Well, yeah, that might work. And so that can often be a, a really valuable thing. What about identifying the stakeholders? We've talked about the difficulties of that, right? Because there are all sorts of secondary effects. And it's very easy to get confused about those and miss those. What about identifying the risks, the possible negative effects on people? Yeah. Good, exactly right. We tend to underestimate, for one thing, the probability. People tend to ignore small probabilities. And they think, oh, what's the likelihood of that? And often that's rational. You know, you say to a friend, hey, maybe we should go to the movies. And they say, well, but gosh, what if a meteor hits the theater? <laughs> You know, that, that's so low, it's, yeah, you laugh. And it's reasonable to laugh, right? You think, that, yeah, that, that's not going to happen. Don't worry about that kind of thing. So it's fine to, um, to basically take certain really low probabilities and set them to zero. On the other hand, we want to be careful about that. What's the odds that the stock market is going to crash this week? 
low, but higher than the meteor, right? <laughs> so that's the kind of thing we probably shouldn't ignore and shouldn't just write off as zero. And there are lots of things like that where we tend to underestimate the, the low probability events and just assign them zero. Now, there are other kinds of mistakes we make, too. What are some of them? Yeah. Ah, okay, good. So we categorize things in terms of things we're familiar uh, with. And sometimes that means we take something that's really new and we just assimilate it to something we're familiar with. This is very well known in the military. It's the, I mean, people will say, yeah, the generals are fighting the last war. And it is common for people to do that. You have some set of categories you're used to thinking about. You encounter a new situation, you say, oh, it's like this one. <laughs> and often, well, it's not that much like that one, right? And it can really lead you into trouble. World War I is a great example of this, where people saw what happened at Cold Harbor in the American Civil War, and they said, how did Grant beat Lee at Cold Harbor? The answer is just wave after wave of soldiers against people in trenches. So that's how you do it. You just send wave after wave. Grant could do it because at that point the Confederate Army was very weak and Grant was very strong and he had a lot of soldiers he could send against them at Cold Harbor. And also, those positions in that terrain weren't all that defensible. But in World War I, the armies were well dug in. Um, they were actually much more evenly matched. That was a disastrous strategy. And yet, in the Western Front anyway, on both sides, generals did that and produced millions of deaths as a result. They were categorizing things by the familiar. Other mistakes. Yeah. Uh, people act off heuristics, so sometimes they'll underestimate probability, but oftentimes they'll overestimate it as well. Okay, good. So you underestimate it. Oh, gosh. Including overestimating the amount of time I had. We're now over. But yeah, last thought here is you're right. Once I draw your attention to the probability, suddenly you start to think. So as soon as your attention is drawn, you also overestimate. You think. Oh, wait, that could happen? And suddenly you panic. Next time we'll talk about more normative problems and the reasons why people began to develop game theory.